Hey, ICP, um, we're going to do a kind of detailed, but hopefully brief um, lecture notes. All right, so it's the last part of this unit dealing with work and power. And with work and power, we also like to talk about the machines that help us do work. All right, so kind of the essential question um, for today is how do simple machines make life easier for us? All right, so that's the key is that it's simple machines. So we're going to strip this down to the very, very basics. All right. First thing I want to do is, you know, reminder of what work is. We've been dealing with that. And so work is when an applied force causes an object to move in the direction of said force, all right, whether that's a push or a pull. Okay. So again, we've had questions like this before, all right? Suppose you try to push a brick wall over. Is this considered work? Why or why not? Well, again, in this situation, as long as that brick wall is still standing, then you did no work. All right. You can push and push and push and you can waste all your energy. But since that brick wall isn't moving, no work is done. And that's kind of what our next slide is talking about. No work is done only when an object moves in the same direction of the force that's being applied. All right. So, again, this is just our typical lecture that we would do in class. So, you know, have you do that. Uh, you don't have to do that this time with that whole two examples of work and two examples of not work unless you absolutely want to jot a few down. All right. As a reminder, formula for work is work equals force times distance or displacement if you want to be a little bit more technical. All right. So what is a machine? All right. A machine is a device that makes work easier by changing the size or direction of a force. All right, so I'm gonna list a couple here and just in your head or even out loud say, hey, is that a machine or is it not a machine? All right, so the first one, a can opener. A doorknob. A brake, like on a bicycle. And then finally a knife. So which one of those are machines and which ones are not machines? Take a minute to kind of think about it and now, if you have to pause the video, all right, and then we'll keep moving on. Okay, the thing is, all four of those items are some type of machine, whether it's a simple machine or a complex machine. So all four of those options that I just gave you are forms of a machine, whether it's one of our six simple machines or a complex machine. Okay, so a complex machine is just that. It's two or more simple machines put together. Right, you can kind of think of it as like a compound sentence or a compound word. All right. We have six types of simple machines, and really one of those has three divisions as well. So it's almost like we have nine, but six basic types. All right. The incline plane, the wedge, the screw, a lever, a pulley, and a wheel and axle. All right. So we're going to go through all of those, give you the definition, how they make work easier and some examples. So you have a list of examples in each of these. All right. So our first one is the incline plane. All right. So you can kind of think of it as just a ramp. It's the easy way to do that. All right. Sorry, my uh, kitchen is letting in a lot of light. Putting it on my face and it's distracting me. So hopefully it doesn't distract you too much. All right. Where the force is being put pushing the object up a ramp while the resistance, which is usually gravity and friction, is um, angled down. All right. So it's a straight slanted surface. It's really simple. Any straight slanted surface is an inclined plane. All right. Um, again, we'll go through some examples here in a minute. Okay. And it makes it work easier because it's easier to move something to a higher or a lower place. All right. And it's doing it by not having it just kind of float or move through air. It is doing it on an object. All right. It makes life a little bit easier. OK, so again, just typical slide from when we would do this in class, moving past it. All right. So things like steps, even though it's called an inclined plane, we just have to connect two levels, a lower level and a higher level. So technically, steps would be an inclined plane. All right, and one way to really kind of vision this to make it more like a ramp is if we took a sheet of plywood or any board, we could put it over some steps and it automatically becomes a ramp or that classic inclined plane look. So if we can do that quite easily by making it just a flat surface, then it falls under inclined plane, all right? Um, even a bathtub technically has a little bit of a slope to it. So that way the water can go into the drain. So we're talking the floor of the bathtub. Okay, a sloped road. 
all right, whether it's a really hilly road or in the mountains or anything like that, if it's at an angle, it's an inclined plane. In fact, if you go trot, drive through the mountains and stuff, there's usually roadsides talking about the incline of it. And it's a 2% grade or a 3% grade, stuff like that. That's talking about how steep of an angle the road is at. Okay. And then just the very basics, like a ramp. All right. So something that you might use to put a lawnmower in the back would pick up. All right. Those are just a few examples. All right. You can come up with more yourself. All right? It's really not hard to go to Google and do that. Our second, um, our second simple machine is the wedge. All right. So again, we're talking about this part right here. All right. This wedge that's in between the block that the hammer is hitting. Okay. All right, so simply put, the wedge is an inclined plane that moves, all right? So it's two inclined planes joined back to back, all right? It's wider or thicker at one end and narrow at the other. So again, if we kind of go back to that picture, it almost looks like a block of cheese or a, a door block, okay? What this is going to do is it makes work easier – sorry, I'm trying to move my – there we go. Makes work easier because when moved, a wedge cuts or splits or pries apart objects, including air and water. So a lot of things get to be a wedge, even if you don't necessarily see it cutting an object. We always got to remember that it's cutting through the particles of air or it's cutting through the water. All right. So again, think like the front of a boat. It's cutting through the water. All right. So the front of any type of boat is a wedge. All right, so again, you can go through and do that on your own, but I'm going to give you a few examples as well. All right, so an axe is a really obvious one. All right, it's designed to cut stuff, but the front of it, and even the back of this one, because this is a fireman's axe. All right, even the back, that pick is even a wedge. Okay, your zipper, technically, that part inside it that is splitting apart these two seams that come together is technically a wedge. Knives. All right, that's their whole function is to cut an object. Okay, again, the front of a boat or the boat's stern. And then a bottle opener. All right, so again, it's in there and it's prying it open. Okay. Moving on to our third one, the screw. Okay, this is an inclined plane wrapped around a cylinder with a wedge at the tip. So it's the screw itself is starting to act a little bit like a compound machine, but since screws are relatively simple, they get thrown in with the simple machine aspect. Okay. Um, this makes work easier because it applies lots of force with very, very little effort. All right. And we use these threads to help decide um, what type of mechanical advantage it offers. All right. So how much easier it applies force. So the closer those threads, all right, are the grooves are set to each other, the greater amount of force that it comply with less effort. Okay. Um, makes work easier because it can also use, be used to hold things together with a relatively high amount of force. So, all right. So again, we could consider a screw a complex machine since it both has that inclined plane and a wedge involved in it. So some people do like to make that argument, but from a classic physics standpoint, um, the screw is a simple machine. All right. All right. So like a swivel stool. So, you know, any type of stool that can spin around has some type of screw to it. All right. A jar lid. So when you unscrew that cap off your two liter of Mountain Dew or Coke or whatever it is, um, that is a screw, anything with threads, people. All right. That's what we're looking at. Drill bits. So again, it's just heavy duty, um, screw. All right. And then like a corkscrew, all right. To help open up bottles. Okay. More threads on a screw makes it easier to turn, but it takes longer to do that because you're having to do more and more threads. All right. So again, a two inch screw that has threads the entire way takes a lot longer to screw in. Whereas if the threads were only halfway, all right. So on that two inch screw, if the threads were only going up an inch, it wouldn't take as long to screw in because you only have to cover all those threads. Whereas the whole two inches, you have to keep going until all of them are screwed in. All right. So 
again, going back to that is earlier question on the, you know, why screw might be called complex machine because it has that incline plane wrapped around the central cylinder and a wedge at its tip. So that way it can get into the material. All right, our next one, the lever. So the thing with the lever is that there's actually three different varieties of this and they get a little bit confusing, all right? The nice thing is that they all have relatively simple names, all right? But trying to remember where things happen gets to be a little bit more complex with it, all right? So just stay with me if you have to, watch this section a couple of times, all right? but we'll get through this. All right, so simply put, a lever is a made up of a bar that pivots at a fixed point called the fulcrum, all right? So this is the point that the bar sits on, all right, and gets flexed on, is the fulcrum, all right? So this is the focal point, all right? And kind of sounds like the word fulcrum, all right? But this is like that focal point where a lot of the uh, energy gets focused at, all right? And this is where we start to see opposites kind of be applied our forces be applied in the opposite direction, all right? So the force applied to a lever is called the effort force. So the effort you put into the machine or the work, the force you put into it. So if you're sitting here using a lever, all right, the you pushing down is the effort force while when the other end of the lever that's trying to pry it off, all right, is the output force all right and the object moved is the load and again there's three different classes of it all right so the very first type is called first class levers all right so the thing with that is first class levers the fulcrum is in the middle kind of think like a teeter-totter all right it's old school teeter-totter and the load and effort is on either side all right so again think classic teeter-totter and you're in really really good shape all right, so again, some examples. So seesaw or teeter-totter, a shovel is technically also a first-class lever, a hammer, all right, using like the claw function, so the backside of it to help pull out a nail that you don't want in there anymore. All right, and then even a pair of scissors. We'll come back to scissors here in a little bit. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of go about classifying scissors. All right. Um, I always like to think of it as their main job is how it gets classified. So the main job of a pair of scissors is to cut. All right. So I have no problem with scissors being called a wedge as well, just because the blade of them, is, that's their function. But when we look at scissors as a whole, all right, they get looped in with the first class levers, even though technically it should probably be considered a complex machine because it's made up of two parts, kind of like how a screw is made up of multiple simple machines as well, but we call it its own class. Okay, second class levers, all right, the lever, the fulcrum is at the end of the point, all right, with the load somewhere in the middle. So where we apply our force, all right, so if my pair of scissors here, if I'm fulcrums right here. I'm applying the effort back here and I would have something sitting here in the middle that makes it a second class lever. So the load is in between the fulcrum and the effort force. All right. So that's the key. All right. So wheelbarrow. All right. Our fulcrum would be where the wheel is, where you lift. All right. The handles is your effort force. All right. And then the loads there in the middle because that's where the bucket sits. Okay, a stapler, fulcrum back here at the hinge. You apply the effort force there at the top and then the load's technically in the middle because it's loaded up with staples. Okay, and then like an old school nutcracker. All right, we got the point right here, the fulcrum right here for it. We've got where we apply the force and then the load would be in the middle, but we're squeezing them together to crack the nuts open. Okay, third class levers. All right, fulcrum is again at the end. All right, so I'm gonna come back to my scissors and as my example, fulcrum's here at the end, but now my effort is in the middle and the load is at the end. So it'd be like I'm taking and I'm trying to sling something, if you think about it. Okay, so almost like an old school catapult from like the medieval times, all right. So a pair of tongs, all right, so again, we have our fulcrum here in the middle, you grab hold in the middle, 
All right, that's where you apply the effort, and then the load gets in the very end. All right, a fishing pole, same way. A broom handle, fulcrum's up here. You apply the effort in the middle, and then it does the work down here at the bottom. And then tweezers are just a really small version of a pair of tongs. All right, but again, an old school medieval catapult would also work. All right, the wheel and axle, probably the easiest one next to the screw. All right, consists of two circular objects of different sizes. All right, a wheel is connected to a post, and that post is just called an axle. All right, so the wheel is larger than an axle. Um, I feel like that's really obvious, but I have students mix that up every now and then. So, okay, makes work easier because it applies more force or lifts a heavier load with less effort. So our examples, a doorknob. All right, think about how you use a doorknob. It has to rotate around, all right, and then it's got a central part. If you've ever taken a doorknob apart, you'll notice that there is a central rod that connects both ends of it. So I don't advise you to do that without your parents' permission, but if you wanted to um, take the doorknob off of your bedroom door or something and you get a look at that, you know, and then put it back together, you would see why a doorknob is a wheel and axle, all right? Um, a wrench and a bolt set, so if you're handy like that. A well crank, so that classic old school um, water well where they're sending it down, all right? This crank, all right, is rotating around and it's got that central rod all the way through it, okay? This well is an example of a complex machine, which we'll get to here in a minute. And a steering wheel, so again, you can't really do this unless you take the auto tech stuff, but if you ever take apart a car, all right, the steering wheel itself is the obvious wheel, but then it, the drive shaft that connects the steering wheel to the actual axles, all right, so you can make a turn is what makes it a wheel and axle system, all right, plus the actual wheels and axles on a car, all right, a pulley, okay, it's a wheel and axle with a groove around the outside. All right, a pulley needs some type of rope, chain, or belt around the groove to make it do work. If not, it's just a wheel and axle, all right? So it's a little bit more of a complex-like machine again. So pulley systems consist of one, can consist of one or more fixed pulleys, one or more mo movable pulleys, or both fixed and movable pulleys, all right? Makes work easier by changing the direction of the force or multiplying the effort used. All right, so like a ski lift is a pulley system. All right, an old school clothesline, not the current ones, but these are the ones that like you see maybe in like European um, movie scenes where it's across the alleys and they can crank them in towards their um, apartment window or something. All right, in a flagpole, um, you can go down to the theater and it's a theater curtain. That's a complex pulley system going on. Cranes. All right, at construction sites are also forms of pulleys. So again, there's a lot of different ways that you can go about getting more of these. Right. Complex machines, we've kind of alluded to them throughout this whole thing because there's a couple examples of simple machines that really should probably just be classified as complex machines. But since they're simple in nature, we don't necessarily think of it that way. All right, complex machines, these are starting to get into our way more advanced pieces of equipment like cars and tanks and planes. All right, and computers, cell phones, things like that. All right. So simple machines can be put together in different ways to make complex machines. It's kind of really basic definition, but it's a working definition for us. All right. So that's it with simple machines. Next week, you will do um, a, two different things of activities with them. And then we are going to do our first e-learning exam next Thursday. And you're going to have a lot of time um, to do that. All right, it's going to be available from next Thursday all the way until the following Monday at midnight. All right, so you're going to have about five days to do it. There's a couple of things that you'll have to get with that. Um, one, you're only going to have an hour, just like any other class. It shouldn't take you an hour. Most people finish the exams in that 30-minute marker, but we like giving you a whole hour so that way you don't ever feel stressed. So it's the same way that this is going to work. It's just all purely on Canvas. All right. Um, 
It's good chatting with all of you. Hopefully you all are staying safe and doing what you need to do. I encourage you to talk with your friends and make sure they are doing everything that they need to do so that way they can be successful as well. All right, stay safe, be happy. See you guys.